Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Photo Biz Live. I'm glad to see so many different attendees join in today. We have uh, an excellent presentation for you today. It's going to be hosted by Rod Evans. How are you doing today, Rod? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing excellent. We're back from Atlanta, from PPA, it's Imaging USA. It was a blast. Yay. <laughs> no, and we're headed off to Florida for SYNC, which you'll be at SYNC, and as you can, I'm sure you can tell everybody, it's always a great, great seminar. Oh, it's such a great event, and... Um, Anything to get away from here, it's uh, five below this morning, so I'm looking forward to Florida. Absolutely. It's very cold here in North Carolina, too. And um, also, guys, just because of uh, we're both in – weather's been wonky for both areas, so if we do have any audio drop, just message me in the box. We've got it uh, pretty well sorted out. We know when it's happening. So we'll try and just pause, and then it seems to have a 30-second delay every now and then. So, you know, don't freak out. We're aware of it, and we are going to make sure that we have everything recorded so it's easy to uh, watch in the end once it's done. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. And if if you are, this is your first webinar with us, or your first time learning about Rod, um, a little bit of background information about Rod. Rod's become a renowned in the industry, known for his innovative portraits. Uh, he combines an intense love of art and photography in his style, which you guys may have seen his on his website at evansimages.com. He's also been requested to lecture nationally as well as internationally for a host of venues, including PPA's Imaging USA, WPPI, and various senior portraits artist events. Um, he's also a PPA national award winner who has been on photoworkshop.com and PhotoVision Video Magazine, and he has been named a top Westcott Pro. Rod's also been selected to be a member of the prestigious Society of XXV, which is an international group of some of the world's finest photographers. So that's just a little background about Rod. I know he's going to talk more about his own background, but before we hold up any more time, I'm going to go ahead and let Rod get started. So Rod, you can go ahead and get us started. Thank you everyone for joining me in this uh, webinar today. I'm excited to share some, some great ideas and just um, basic principles of how to make your subjects more beautiful using lighting and um, different types of lighting and uh, posing techniques um, that will bring the best out of everyone that you photograph. So thank you again for being here and um, sharing um, and listening and sharing with me and I'll be happy to answer any questions you guys have toward the end of this, uh, this webinar. So just a little bit about myself before we get started. Um, I have um, four daughters from the ages of uh, 20 down to the age of seven. And so that insight <laughs> of a uh, uh, drama-filled home with lots of shoes and pink and purple laying everywhere really helps me understand what, or gives me some insight into what girls really are looking for and what, what they feel makes them beautiful. And so what we're going to talk about is more than just even the lighting and the posing, but really just about an attitude of, of creating beautiful images for people. So um, I've been in business for about 20 years, and um, I've been fortunate enough to study with some great photographers um, that really um, inspired me and, and helped me out. So I'm going to share some, a lot of things that I've learned from everyone else and put it together and, and um, bring it back to you. So here's my beginning principle about beauty is that it's, um, our campaign for our studio is everyone is beautiful. And um, we have a campaign that um, talks about that we truly believe that everyone is beautiful. And so I think it really begins with an attitude. You know, it's not just a light, it's not just a piece of equipment, it's just not a technical thing that you have that allows you to bring beauty out of your subjects. But it's, it's how you truly care about your subjects, that you, you see the beauty in everyone. And if you do that, it, that reflects back in your images because you're, you want people to see what you see in that, in that person. So it's about building self-confidence. Um, it's amazing to have moms come back to me and say, you would not believe the difference in my child from the time you know, we created these images until the time she saw these images, how they blossomed or how, how much they, their confidence has grown. Um, because they've seen themselves in a way they've never seen themselves before. So it begins with that. Before the technical stuff, it really begins with how you see and how you feel and, and your desire to um, bring beauty out of everyone. If you, and that's why we got in this business in the first place, right? Is the fact that we see those things. We see what maybe, um, we see things in that person that other people may have never even seen before or recognized. Even a parent 
and bring that out of that person so to, to share with everyone. So we begin with that. And I think of, you know, I think of this person, I think, you know, if, if I were this person, you know, what would I want, you know, what, what are the best things that I can bring out of this person? What, can, what are the best features when I first meet that person? What do I see from them? Is it their eyes? Is it their smile? Is it their expression? Is it their, their, um, their attitude? What is it that I see in that person that I want to bring that out of, um, the best of that person? That's where it begins. Um, um, with, is with an attitude like that. So then where do you take that? Okay, so that's great. You want to make them beautiful. <clears throat> you believe that they're beautiful. And you want to make them, you know, everyone else to see that. So yes, I want to bring out some features. I want to bring out their eyes. I want to bring out their hair, whatever their best features are. But along with that, obviously, there's going to be flaws. And I'm not going to want to just come up to them and say, hey, uh, you know, uh, I see your left eye is a lot smaller than your right eye. Um, don't worry about that. I'll fix that for you. You know, we have to have some tact to what we do, obviously. And I don't come up and ask people, what do you think? I don't ask this question, which is, do you have anything that you want to make sure doesn't show in your images? Um, what, are you, what do you feel are your weak areas? I want to make this a very positive experience for them. So it's my job to be able to analyze them without them realizing that I'm analyzing them what their strong and what their weak areas are. So it begins by doing kind of a facial analysis and even a physical analysis very quickly to be able to determine what are their best features and so forth. So what do you look for? Well, first you determine what type of facial structure they have, you know, and based on their facial structure, different lighting patterns, especially for your headshots, um, are going to look better than others. So I determine First of all, what is their facial type? And um, so this is just a diagram of different facial types that we all should know. And so what I do is that I, <clears throat> when I look at everyone, I look and just quickly analyze for the good things, what I want to bring out of them, and then anything that, any facial flaws that I might want to hide, right, or conceal or diminish um, on them. They can't know you're doing this. You can't tell them this. You can't ask them, you know, you have to be very, very tactful about it. You can't stare them down either, of course, <laughs> and go, hmm, let me look at you, right? I mean, you can't. It could also be the width of their eyes. If you want the perfect facial structure, that's what you get. All right, we're still there? Good. Sorry about the static. <laughs> it's this cold South Dakota weather. Um, so those are some of the things that you're looking for is, you know, Okay, what, first you have to identify what does a perfect face look like, right? What does a perfect face look like? What are the perfect features of a face? And then analyze that person and go, okay, not saying this to them, analyze this to them and say, okay, their eyes are very close together. Their um, nose is fairly wide or long. Um, their um, uh, one eye is smaller than the other. Um, they have two chins. Um, what is it that, what things you see in them quickly when you first identify them are things you want to probably minimize. And then what we're going to talk about is how to minimize those things, okay? We're going to talk about how to maximize things, and we're going to talk about how to minimize things too, um, both with lighting and posing for headshots, three-quarter length, and full-length shots, okay? So for all of those different areas. And just some fun uh, fun lighting techniques too. So I'm going to show you some diagrams and some things like that to, uh, also. Okay, so let's begin. All right, so there's so many different things you can do. Um, you, I mean, this, this is just one demonstration quickly to show you that using a long lens, obviously as portrait photographers we know that long lenses are more preferable for headshots than a wider angle lens. Pretty obvious. But camera angle can make such a huge difference in the image. This image is shot with a 200 millimeter lens on the, uh, the first image. And the second image is shot with the exact same lens, but at a slightly higher camera angle. We're only talking maybe another 12 to 8 inches, 18 inches higher, and what a significant difference it makes in the image um, as far as the narrowing of her face and um, her nose now being down more uh, than up. So what a dramatic difference just something simple as this is. See, here's how I think about it. Well, this is kind of just some of my lighting diagrams that I have, but here's kind of my, you know, my take on all of this, is that you control the viewer's eye. That's your job, right, as a photographer. You 
make the viewer, the person that's looking at this image, you control where their eyes go, what they look at, what, um, what they see. That's your skill. Just like a painter or an architect does the same thing, is that they, they draw you in, you know, the viewer, and draw them to where they want them to go. You can do the same thing with your lighting, your posing, the tools that are at your disposal, which are lens selection, camera angle, posing, clothing, all those kind of things that have another slide coming up on that, but it talks, you are the one that, that, that makes that decision. That's your skill set. That's what you do. You have the passion to bring that from people, and you also have the tools at your disposal and the knowledge at your disposal to control what the viewer sees and what they don't see. What they don't see just doesn't exist sometimes. So through your lighting, composition, and posing, like an artist, you're going to draw that viewer right to where you want them to go. Um, so we'll talk about each little technique and how you're going to do that and how I do that in my images um, in all these slideshows. So let me just show you a few lighting techniques and uh, diagrams that I use. Um, I'm going to show you about three or four different lighting scenarios that I use. Uh, this is a, one right here. Uh, it's just a grid light. I use a lot of kickers in my images. Um, basically, kickers are just backlights. And a grid light, of course, is just a small funneled uh, light source. So what it does is, is it lights only what I want it to light, and everything else goes pretty dark in the image. So. Um, for example, this light was, this is, it's a hard light, it's hard but soft, it's kind of crazy, and it definitely looks good in black and white. So let me just talk about one problem area. I'm a little ADD, if you can't tell, so I'll bounce from lighting to posing to whatever, um, all in one breath probably, but hopefully you can keep, you can, you get that. And probably the same way, I would guess most of us are. So in this scenario is, um, is I'm using a grid light. Again, a slightly higher camera angle, definitely for correcting for double chins. Double chins are pretty easy to correct for. It's very simple. Now, I don't, as you know, you have people lean forward just a little bit because photography is two-dimensional. So if they lean forward, what's closer to the camera is larger. What's farther away from the camera is smaller. So if you want to make something smaller, get it away from the camera. So if you want to make it larger, get it closer. So I lean them slightly toward the camera with their shoulders into the thing. I have them pull their chin forward. That will reduce that double chin or pull that skin forward. Now, do I tell them, pull your chin forward to get rid of your double chin? Do I tell them to, you know, uh, push your chin out like a turtle? Absolutely not. What I say is, is lean into the image, pull forward, project into the camera. So when I give them directions and I show them exactly what I want them to do, and I demonstrate it for them, but I tell them I want them to project. It's going to be friendlier and, and more appealing if you project to the camera versus push your head out and look like a turtle. Um, it just doesn't sound good or I want to get rid of your double chin or whatever. So again, I want to keep it positive. I want them to feel beautiful and all of that. So a lot of it is how you communicate with them. Okay, you're like, what is this crazy slide? Okay, so there's good and bad examples of working with people Eyes are such a huge part of the communication process when you're working with someone. So um, there are definite do's and definite don'ts, okay? So image number one that you're seeing right now is a don't. Her eye is cutting across her nose. So that is a definite no. As you can tell, it's a little creepy looking and a little strange, okay? So you want to give those eyes room to breathe. So make sure the eyes are always following the nose. What that means is, is that, you know, turn their nose, leave their eyes in that position, and then just turn them slightly back to the camera. So the eyes are following the angle of the nose in these images. And number one is obviously showing you a bad example of, of uh, pushing those eyes right inside that nose. That's definitely not what you want to do. Here's another example of how to correct for a double chin. You know me, bouncing around. Again, leaning forward and projecting into the camera, all right? This is probably uh, one of my favorite lighting scenarios. This is what I use quite a bit. Um, this is a beauty dish with two kickers, and then that light that has an F8 beside it right now that you're looking at, that is a strip light that is under the subject, okay? So that light is lighting their eyes is what it's doing. The beauty dish that you see in that image is actually about only 18 to inches away from them, and it's tipped down. This is a 
killer on a, on a beauty dish. It's very close to the subject, but it's also tipped down at about a 45 degree angle. So one light is tipped up, the strip light, to their eyes. The beauty dish is tipped down to their eyes at about a 45 degree angle. And then behind them are two kicker lights for separation. Um, F11, F8, sometimes F16 to F22. It's pretty sharp lighting, but because it's so close, you'll see it has a very, very soft look about it. Um, those two black cards that you see are gobos. What those do is that they block the light from flaring back into your lens. So that even though I have egg crates on my lights, which are basically little strips that keep the light from flaring back into your lens, I have an additional layer of security by putting in these black cards. And those black cards will, um, you can just make them out of foam core. And um, uh, you know basically they're giant black cardboard panels that I put to make sure that the light, I, when, I, when I'm looking at the subject, I cannot see those two back kicker lights at all because um, I don't want that flaring back. If it does, if you don't do this, it's going to reduce the amount of saturation and get some flare and really soften the image up too much. So the beauty dish is about um, uh, at a tip at a 45 degree angle, and I would say it's about 12 inches above their head, so it's real close. It's just barely out of the image. I'm using about an 18 inch beauty dish typically. I'll use a okay. We are back. Okay, <laughs> I didn't say anything else other than the height of that beauty dish is about 12 inches above the subject's head. You can almost see the beauty dish in the photograph, okay? I mean, it's just like right at the top of the edge of their head, tipped into 45. Again, I get that kicker light for their eyes, same thing, about as close as I can get it, but it's not in the image. Let me show you a couple examples of what it looks like. So you can see the beauty dish um, in this lighting setup is the top catch light in her eye, that bottom catch light in her eye is that strip light, okay? So don't worry, I've got lots of pictures like this because it is one of my favorite, favorite lighting scenarios. I love how rich and creamy it makes the skin. I love the glow that it gives to their uh, jawline and face. And it definitely looks great when you pull their hair back from their face to really accentuate that beautiful jawline or the beautiful face um, is what it does. Here's another, this is my daughter actually, same lighting scenario. So um, accentuates the jawline, beautiful catch lights in the eyes. Um, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous lighting scenario. And another one, sorry, okay. Again, one of my very, very favorite lighting scenarios. It's kind of my go-to beauty lighting. All right, so how else can I control the viewer? How they perceive what they are seeing? Well, we talked about camera angle. How about this for an example? Okay, this, the, first image in the top left image is shot, with, these are both shot with the same lens. These are shot with a, I'm going to say a 70 millimeter lens in both of these images, probably even to a 50 millimeter lens um, in both of these images. And again, what I'm doing is I'm using camera angle. So camera angle is not, you know, closer, bigger, farther away, smaller. So by putting your camera at a higher angle, those hips are farther away from the camera. And the, the slight amount of, even just a slight amount of distortion in the lens at 50 millimeters will also um, project that those hips are even smaller and farther away from the camera. So you control. The other one, you're, you're going to say, yeah, guess what? This is really what this person looks like. Okay, camera angle again, same thing. Slightly widening the lens, about a 50 millimeter lens. One's at, at her eye level. The next image is about 18 to 24 inches higher than her eye level makes such a significant difference between the two images. Which one would you want to be perceived as? Which one do you want to have people see you as? This is what shows that you're the skilled photographer, that you can bring these things to the table. Again, same kind of a thing, okay? This is a little more dramatic, you know, and crazy, but um, again, shows you that. So those are your tools. What do you have in your tool bag? You have your lenses, your camera angle, your lighting, short or broad lighting, which we'll show you, your background selection, which we're going to talk about, clothing selection, which we're going to talk about, and some more posing techniques we're going to talk about, okay? So let's get to it. So again, slightly higher camera angle in the shots. Posing, along with background selection, can make such a huge difference in the image. The first image, look at the legs, how they're apart, making those hips look wider. Moving that 
front leg across to the across the back leg like it is in the second image thins out those hips. Also raising her up and making her a little bit arch that back and become a little bit stronger versus just hunching over makes a significant difference in the image. What else about this image? The background selection. If they're wearing black and using a black background, it's going to minimize any um, separation or sizing, things like that are all going to be minimized by using a background that blends them into it, not completely, you know what I mean, but somewhat minimizes uh, any size issues with who you're working with. Now, so that doesn't work with it. That works with black on black. That works with white on white. That works with green on green. Whatever it is to get that person to kind of blend in with their environment or their background. Same thing can be said to with foregrounds, not just backgrounds. You can put things in front of your subjects, okay, to minimize or distract the eye from making decisions on the size of a person. So um, I use foregrounds all the time on my images. Um, what you see is simply just not there. So um, we definitely use foregrounds a lot in our images. This is pretty dramatic, but you know you can definitely see that it's still really, really beautiful, you know, and you can minimize um, any size issues or anything like that by just putting foreground on the image. And, and it's still it's extremely beautiful. I would do that with any size person, okay? So um, Again, another example of that, of just something in the foreground, them leaning around that, and what you don't see simply doesn't exist. I'm using my Tony Robbins voice. Okay. <laughs> Next. Here are some other common problems, of course. You know, double chins, um, heavy arms, wide hips, you know, round face, all those kind of things. This pose actually works for every single one of those, okay? This is kind of that upside down flipped over pose. Uh, this pose actually works for every single one of those issues because the chin is pulled forward in this pose. It has to be because they're leaning back. The hips are farther away from the camera, so it works for those kind of things. Um, for the arms are pulled away from the body. Um, so it is, it, and it's a beautiful pose. This is a beautiful girl. Um, and what a great um, way to portray them, really fun and beautiful, and just a simple, beautiful um, pose you can do um, to eliminate all those things um, the subject, and really fun image. Here's another example of the same thing, um, but just another example of the same kind of um, thing that you can do um, with people. Now, this is obviously just a little higher camera angle than the other one, but still the basic principles still completely work for that image. Same kind of thing, not upside down, but um, but the same thing at a high camera angle, and the body's positioned far away from back. Even even the softening, you know, even the shallow depth of field is minimizing things that are in the background. So foreground, everything close, and then pushing everything farther away using longer lenses to give it that soft, beautiful look like that. Seated poses, okay? These are tough ones. So um, what what these are is this first one is I never have anyone sit flat on their bottom. Um, because it, it's, it just mushrooms them and squishes them, and, and it's just never flattering. Um, so this girl was charming and nice enough to do this for me <laughs> and say, I just need some examples, and so help me out for this. But um, so we, instead of having them sit on their bottom, I have them turn their body, like you see in the second image there, and, and sit on their side, okay, or the bony part of their hip bone is what I have them turn to. So if they twist, they have to actually physically kind of lift themselves up, twist their body to their hip bone, and then cross that top leg slightly over the bottom leg, okay, which is now going to slenderize both of those legs um, in that image and pull them away from the camera. This gives you a much slender inside um, hips and legs in the image. So I do this all the time. So, you know, people are sitting on the ground um, for a pose, and they just, you know, sit down, boom, or lean, or whatever. I'm like, I demonstrate to them, pick yourself up, twist, sit on the hard side of your hip bone, right, and pull that top leg slightly over the bottom leg, and it's just such a slenderizing look to the image. Here's a fun little technique that I just accidentally discovered one time. <laughs> Mistakes are great. We as artists love, um, gosh, I, I digress, but as an artist, you should never be afraid to fail. And if you, have, if you make a mistake, you should rejoice. And um, because from those things we learn, and from those things uh, we are able to create 
even greater things. So like I had my camera s or my lights at the wrong settings one time, the stinking thing just flared all over the place. And I'm like, wait a minute, that looks great. Again, I'm just blending her, you know, um, waistline into the background with some lens flare and and it, it just looks beautiful. So so it's just a little tri trick. You put your background light instead of pointing to your background, have about half of your light peeking around the, the hip of your subject or the waistline of your subject um, between their arm and waistline. And you'll have to kind of play with this and shoot a few different shots. You know, is it full power, half power, depending on your light? What looks the best? I don't have so much lens flare that I can't even see your face, but enough lens flare that it's just giving me some, some fun little whatever glam excitement in the image, and at the same time, um, minimizing some areas on your um, all right, you know, all, all right, Rod, your audio is back now. Clothing. Okay, sorry. That okay. was perfect, actually. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, right back into the okay. next one. Yep, so I went back a slide, guys, because I want to talk about clothing for a second. Like you see in this image here, she's wearing the right clothing. She, you know, I, I instruct her what to wear. And so for her, you know, this black outfit is great. Basically long-sleeved, you know, um, beautiful black outfit um, for her to wear. So that's perfect, um, and that's what you want to do. You know, you want to tell your subjects to wear, you know, things like this that will be flattering, to avoid horizontal stripes, you know, um, things that they, you know, um, you know, if, if you don't want to have heavier arms in your images, you know, don't wear, you know, sleeveless shirts and all those kind of things, you know, but as much as we tell our subjects to do these things, it doesn't always happen. So, um, so what do you do if that happens? Well, worst case scenario, you crop, okay? <laughs> um, the, which is funny, but, but the truth. So if that happens, simply just crop it out, okay? I mean, sh obviously you shoot some with that, you know, with their outfit in it, but show them the option, what it looks like with the image crop too. So just zoom in and crop out what you don't want to see in the image. And so I'll definitely use this technique along with anything like, you know, foreground distractions or background, you know, blending, all those kind of things, that combination of things. But if any of those combinations are not working, I'll definitely go to my last resort, which is crop closer in the image, okay? Sorry, if I'm talking really fast, I don't mean to, and I want to leave time for questions um, at the end of this, so I'm, I'm kind of kind of cooking along here, and then I, I'll leave time for Q&A &A and maybe talk about some other images and stuff. But um, this is another go-to lighting for me also. Um, if you don't have one of these, it should be called a money light instead of a ring light. Um, I don't think I've ever shot an image with this that I've never sold. Um, and that is the truth. It is just its ridiculous. Um, this looks great on guys, looks great on young girls, looks great on middle-aged women because there's there is not a wrinkle on their face um, with this light. It's extremely bright, um, and it's a continuous light. Um, you can get it from myringlight.com. Use my code, RodEvans10. I think it saves you some money on it, 10% is what it is. What this light does, and I'll show you some examples of it coming up, but it's, it's, it's very wrinkle-reducing. It has very fast fall-off. I use this light about 12 to 18 inches from the subject, so it's very, very close to the subject and very, very bright. I use a long lens, of course, um, usually about 180 to 200 millimeters with my 7200. And then again, I, I, I add, so in this scenario, I'm using constant light and I'm using strobe photography both. So it's kind of a tricky scenario. So I, you know, I've done this. I used to do this, just one ring light up against the wall. Boom, pretty flat, kind of boring, looks okay. Then you can mix it up by, you know, maybe using a, another light in there um, to mix it up, you know, continuous light to mix it up. Um, I think they even have continuous kicker lights, too, that you can get, um, which I've used before, too. In this scenario, though, I'm using strobes in conjunction with continuous light. So how do you do that? Well. So I set my camera to manual mode, obviously. I'm going to shoot this at 2.8 because um, for that light. And my ISO, I can't even read it, 
in this scenario because I got this little thing on. So just excuse me as I do this. I don't even say in this scenario. Sorry, that's all right. I, I'll tell you what I do. Okay, because I shoot this all the time. So I shoot at 2.8, maybe 50th to 60th of a second. My ISO is usually about 125, uh, 160, somewhere in there. And then um, what I do is I adjust my strobes. I turn the power down about as low as I possibly can get them so that it's not overpowering. So I'm shooting at 2.8. It doesn't take a lot of strobe light to create an edge light at 2.8. So I turn my strobes down about as low as I possibly go, grid everything off, and give me that nice separation between the subject and the background by, by using strobe along with continuous light. And you can, this is a fun thing to play with, guys, by the way. You can use this for window light with a strobe. You can use this, you know, um, mixing color temperatures. That's another thing I need to talk about is that the color temperature of this light, for me, it looks best at around 4,500 Kelvin. So it's a little cool um, for the strobes, but it kind of gives it this glamorous kind of look because it is just a little bit cool. Now here's a ring light used without the strobes. This is just a ring light without anything at all, just the ring light, um, what it looks like and how it has such beautiful, fast fall off. Not a single wrinkle on this person. Reduces eye bags, wrinkles, all those kind of things. Yes, it puts a circle around their eye, just like that. Make sure that you, when you do this, that that circle is right around their pupil, not cutting through their pupil. It takes a little bit of practice, moving their head and their chin and the light in the right position so that light goes exactly around there. Now, yeah, once every 100 clients might ask me to retouch that out, but pretty much everyone loves it. So it's never been an issue. If it's something that bothers you, obviously you could take it out um, or change it or soften it or do whatever. But like I said, about one out of every 100 people even, even mention it or even talk about it. So Because I shoot directly to an iPad, and I'm showing these images, and I'm showing them their eyes, and I'm showing them how beautiful it is and touting the benefits of it. And, um, and so that's why no one really says much about it. There's more images in it with what the background light looks like. So these are my beauty lighting techniques is what I use. The, the beauty dish, the strip, the ring light, and the grid light are my three beauty techniques or three beauty lighting scenarios that I use. Um, I also use that beauty dish on location. Uh, just bring your uh, light with a power pack. Um, you can get power packs from, uh, from my Paul Buff. Um, from Alien Bees, they've got great power packs there. You can uh, plug your uh, power pack right on location and um, go outside and again, use beauty lighting techniques with really powerful lighting on location, um, applying a lot of these same principles that we talked about today. So there, I know I talked really, really fast, <laughs> didn't I? I'm so sorry because I wanted to leave time for questions or whatever at the end. So are there any questions at all? All right, everybody. Yeah, no, there's definitely questions that had come through, Rod. So now is the time. I think everyone was just writing down notes and keeping up with I'm your sorry. pace. And that was uh, a lot of information to take in, which is great. I, I definitely learned a lot of different ideas just from that and caught myself saying, oh, so that's how he did that. So that was, I think everybody learned a lot from it. So they can go ahead and type in their questions right now into the chat window. Perfect. And really, guys, this is the beginning, okay? This is your inspiration. This is very basic, as you know. This is a starting or a jumping point. You know, just study people all the time. You know, wherever you're at, when you're shopping or you're bored, you're sitting at the mall and you're watching people, look at them, study them, you know, analyze different faces, analyze why is this, what makes this person so beautiful without being a creep about it, right, uh, and or a stalker about it, but... Um, Really, really just study, you know, um, paintings and artists and, and um, all those things that, that, that bring beauty to people. And, and I don't know, I mean, for me, it's, it's because I have such a desire to build the confidence of the person that I'm photographing. I mean, I, I can't think of anything more that I can do for them and build them up and make them feel really, really great about themselves. Oh, and absolutely. So, I want to have every tool at my disposal to do that, you know, and just blow them away. I mean, I just I start to build their confidence, and that will show in the images too, because you're confident in what you're doing. They can see that the images are creating, becoming beautiful, and that will also translate into the images, definitely. 
Very good. And Ron, we lost probably a good 30 seconds of that answer that you just uh, said over to everybody. So I'm sorry about that. We had some static that came through. No worries. It, really what I was just saying is that you is when you're when you're skillful and you build the and you're building this person up and you create these beautiful images for them as soon as possible is that their confidence level changes and you can see it in their eyes you can see it in their expression um, they it, it just communicates and translates when you're creating images so I try to do one of these beauty lighting techniques as soon as I can because I want them to go oh my gosh I you know you know I had no idea I, you know, I've always taken pictures with my cell phone. I've never seen myself like that before, right? <laughs> or whatever, school pictures. And so um, to have someone that's skillful that sees, you know, okay, if I, if, for example, one eye is smaller than the other, what do you do, right? You, it's so simple. All you do in this scenario is put the small eye closer to the camera. Again, what's closer is larger, what's farther away is smaller. So that will balance out those two eyes is by simply bringing that small eye closer to the camera. Those skills that you use, you know, being a higher angle, you know, mean to reduce the size of their chin, you know, and elongate that face to make it more narrow, you know, those skills that you bring to the table is going to build their confidence up right away and get them excited and get, you're going to get even better images and more excitement out of them because you're showing them immediately um, how you're going to make them so beautiful in their images. Awesome, and we have a first question come in from Maria, and this is, and we got a, quite a few questions about the ring light. So her question was, are you shooting through or over the ring light? Yeah, right through the middle of it. Yeah, it's kind of like being in an optician's office or something. Mm -hmm. It's kind of bizarre, I know, but yeah, you shoot right through the middle of the ring light. And I did send that code over to everybody, which is myringlight.com, and the code is Rod Evans 10 if you want to go to that slide, Rod. And just so everybody knows, when you go to the website, you can get a they, um, there's a picture of it in the top left corner, how you would shoot through it, and there's a video presentation. I'm sure that I'm pretty sure they have it right there whenever you land on the homepage of myringlight.com. Yeah, it seems to be a great a, tool that a lot of people are using. I'll tell you what, yeah, I've been using it for three years. I was one of the Brian was so nice to let me be one of the first people to use it, and um, oh, wow, I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you want beauty in your images and, 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 and beautiful lighting in your images. This is definitely one tool that you need in your tool, but an absolute must in your toolbox. Again, it's a very close light, so it's only four headshots. Now, you guys, you can get creative and do other stuff with it, too. I'm not saying that, but in this particular application, even if this image you're looking at on the bottom left, you can actually see, I didn't crop it out, the bottom, that corner is actually the light in the top left part of that image and the bottom um, left part of that image is the ring light. It's that close to the subject, so you got to kind of get it right in there and just kind of crop it right out. So, very nice, and that gives you Maria an answer to that. Um, this kind of goes hand in hand. Uh, you said you know you'd use this more for headshots, and Robert Gunter had a question. So Robert's question, uh, he says, he has to photo shoot a lot of corporate headshots, and he's um, generally they're composed of shooting large people, both men and women. He says, I can at least put them on a slight angle from the camera and shoot at a little higher angle, but the lighting must show their face with little to no shadows. Right, do you have any suggestions? Yeah, um, definitely. I do a lot of corporate headshots too, um, business portraits and all of that. And um, so while you can do the traditional lighting, you know what I mean, the softbox or the umbrella with a kicker and a reflector and doing that, you can definitely incorporate these techniques, like what we talked about, these lighting scenarios, into a headshot like what you were just talking about. Say it again to me, they want flat, no shadows. Yeah, he said since it's corporate stuff, you know, he has to, the lighting must show their face with little to no shadows on it. Yeah, okay, so I would definitely that use this, this is what I use for a lot of business corporate headshots. Um, and if you go to my website, I'll make sure that I put one on there. I'm not sure if there is one right now or not, but I'm, I'm sure there is because um, I'll use a high key background. This is a scenario used for, for corporate headshots. And then I'll use a, they look so good with a white sweep or white background, of course, you know what I mean? So it's easy to cut out. They look great on the web and they look so good 
like very commercial looking. They look like they're from a magazine kind of a kind of a look. Very flat lighting because you've got that beauty dish on top and the kicker on the bottom. So you've got basically no shadows on the face, just some fall off on the edges, which is perfect, right? And then you've got um, some edge light keeping around them. And then what you do is add a background light to make that background white or light gray, whichever you're shooting for the corporation, um, whichever they prefer because they want to knock it out possibly really easy. Um, um, I sell more of that than I do with a brown background or with the umbrella or with the traditional business type of portraits that you see um, because they think that's what they want when they start out. And then I show them this when I shoot it and they're like, oh no, you were right, this is the image I'm getting. I'm like, I know, it's just so much more modern and up to date. So this beauty lighting technique is definitely one you can use for um, corporate shots. One trick I'm gonna tell you this, now when you're looking at this diagram right now, you're gonna see everything straight on, right? That's because the subject's nose is straight to the camera right now. Now if you're shooting a corporate shot, you're not gonna have his head straight to the camera. You might have his nose turn, you know, 10 or 15 degrees away from the camera and the eyes coming back. Take your lights, those two lights, that beauty edition, that strip light, they're in front of that subject right now. Follow the nose, okay? So if that subject is turned a little bit to the right, move those lights with the nose, right or left. Just follow those lights to the, of the nose, and it'll give you that nice flat lighting again. All right, and going, you know, staying on the slide here with the um, with the black cards. We had a few questions about, you know, what the black cards their purpose serves in the setup. Can you go a little bit more in detail about that? Absolutely. They're actually very, very critical part of this image because those two background lights, those kicker lights, um, are aimed basically at your camera right now. And even though they have egg crates in them, there's still light coming toward your camera. So what those cards are doing, they're actually about six feet high, five to six feet high, and about three foot, well, I want to say two and a half by two and a half feet, something like that, maybe two foot by four, yeah, because they're probably four by eight sheets that I cut in half. So it's two foot by two foot, about six, I cut them a little lower, so they're about six feet high. So they're sitting right on the ground. And what they're doing is, is that when you look through your camera lens, make sure you don't see those two lights that are marked F22, make sure you cannot see them in any sight of your lens at all. So that light is not flaring back into your lens. If that light is flaring back into your lens, you're losing saturation and contrast. And so what this is doing is allowing you to give separation to your subject without losing any contrast or saturation because of the, the light flaring back into your lens. All right, great info right there. So let's take a few more questions here. And guys, if you are joining us late and you, a question just popped up, like I said, just use the chat tool to type them in here. And I'm sifting through. A bunch just came through, so hang on a second here. <laughs> All right, this uh, so changing, um, we're talking about posing and lighting. This comes back from Kathy. She just wants to know, what's your favorite go-to lens? Like, what's probably the lens that's on your camera the most? Yeah, I mean, Kathy, it's really the 7200. Um, I hate to say it, but it really is my go-to lens. The reason I, I hate to have one lens that is my lens all the time because I, I want to say, hey, I'm an artist, I change, I do this, <laughs> you know, whatever. But honestly, that is my lens that I use 80% of the time. You know, I have a fisheye, I have a wide, I, I have so many different lenses available to me um, to use, but 80% of the time I'm grabbing that 7200. It's on my camera most of the day. Um, it just has such a beautiful shallow depth of field to it. It has great variety to it. I'm usually using it at about 80 to, to 200, 180 to 200 most of the time. So I'm going to get as much compression and as much shallow depth of field as I possibly can get. Um, and then probably my second lens that I use after that would probably be um, a 50 at 1.4. All right, cool. And let's jump in here and grab some other questions. All right, and this is from Kathy. So Kathy wants to know, um, when you're doing these shoots, like, um, are you are you always using a tripod, or you, you know, when when do you how often do you find yourself using one? We had a couple of people ask about your use of a tripod. Okay, that's a really good question. So um, a tripod, I use a tripod, or I use a mono stand in my camera room uh, most of the time. Probably about 90% of the time my camera moves using a monopod. On location, if I'm shooting an individual, like a high school senior or a child, um, I 
and not on a tripod. Yes, it is risky, and yes, you have a few more out of focus images, but they, with the advantage for me, and you're going to hear different camps on this. I've got a lot of good friends that would disagree with me. The, the, the advantages are you're going to be able to quickly change perspectives and see things and it allows you a little bit more creativity in your images. The, the, the negative side of it is, is every image going to be as stinking sharp as it possibly can? Probably not. So, um, so there's disadvantages and advantages, but um, because I am shooting the iPad, I can really see, you know, am I getting it? Is it really there? Um, so, I, so on location, unless it's a large group or a family, I'm always using a tripod for things like that because you want tack sharp images. So I'm definitely putting on a tripod for that. But for an individual um, on location, typically no tripod. And um, in the studio, 90% of the time on, in a using a tripod or a mono stand. All right, and we, uh, Kathy, thank you for that answer. So this question comes in. Quite a few people came in um, and wanted to know about when you're shooting to an iPad, how exactly you're achieving this, and are you, you know, what are you tethering, or what, um, which, you know, which method are you doing this with? Yeah, sorry, I keep saying that, and I didn't talk about it, but um, the the here's how I do it. Um, I use um, it's all wireless. I shoot Canon. And I believe this available. This option is available for other cameras too, using iFi cards. But for me, I use um, Canon's wireless remote. It looks like a battery, you know, like an extra battery pack that you put on the bottom. It's a Wi-Fi unit from Canon. It's about seven, eight hundred dollars, and then you're completely wireless. Basically, it's just setting up an IP address um, that you put on your iPad, the, um, the uh, application or the app for the iPad is called Shutter Snitch, and um, it's like a, I don't even know, $40 or $50 app for your iPad, and that allows it to communicate directly with your camera, either using an iFi card or wireless unit. I would, um, if, I would definitely do this, which is, um, if any of you know Gary Box, um, on his website, he has a um, tutorial that you can buy that shows you how to do this with your camera. I would, it's worth the $49 because honestly, setting it up, you almost have to be a rocket scientist. And actually, Gary Box might be one because um, he's figured out how to do it. You don't have to think about it. I spent two days trying to do it and got so frustrated, it just drove me nuts. I was going to stick an ice pick in my eyeballs. And, um, but. Gary's got step by step by step. Here's what you type in. Here's the IP addresses. Here's what you you know one one step at a time. And once it's set up, it's set up and it just runs. I haven't had to touch it in three or four years. It just runs and runs and runs. So um, so it, it's such a great tool to build confidence in the people you're photographing. The parents can be seeing the images as you're creating them, so they have full confidence in what you're doing. Um, they can even be in the other room. You know, and seeing what you're shooting. You know, if the child doesn't want them in there or whatever. You know, I mean, it's pretty cool. And it has an option where you put your watermark over the images as they're popping up on the iPad. So they're not using their iPhone to take pictures on your iPad of the image you're creating. Just a little tidbit there for you, okay? Very that's cool. That's, that's very good info, <laughs> right? Yeah, but it has. <laughs> somebody, somebody will find a way to do that. Well, I will, uh, I'm going to grab that. I'm going to try to find the link to Gary's site while we're as, uh, while you're answering another question because nice. some people uh, were interested in getting that URL, so I'll do my best to get that and send it. Okay, in. thank you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, jumping back to, um, and I have a couple people in here, and they're just asking, you know, they, they're saying that all of your models look great, and what are you doing if you just really get someone who, and we don't want to all say it, I guess, but you get someone in there that I guess is just, maybe just really homely looking or you know where 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 do you start with that and I and I would think that everyone and your goal for people to take away from this is that they are good looking models from here but you can use these tips on anybody regardless of how they look but I'll, well, I'll let you answer the question yeah I know and I get this question all the time you know I know I probably should have included some befores and afters for you to be honest with you but I, I have a hard time doing that because I don't want to show anyone in a negative light. I mean, it's just so part of my personality. It's so sad. But anyway, um, the reality is is that these 
girls are not as beautiful as you think they are <laughs> in these images that you're seeing. I mean, yes, some of them absolutely are. Some, obviously, we've helped them out um, through the lighting and posing and all of that. Let me just throw you a few ideas by you that will help that person. Okay, number one is, you know, heavy set. So, well, you know, I've talked about techniques for that, you know, leaning them, leaning them close to the camera, moving the body away, lighting, clothing selection, all those kind of things, obviously. But what if, um, uh, what if they come in and here's some advantages that we have. We have, a, uh, we have the ability to do makeup at our studio too, so we can help them out with that. That's one of our packages, comes with makeup. So you may want to put in your, if you, if you can't do that or you don't have the ability at your studio, you may want to put in your materials to tell people to have a professional makeup and hair artist um, do their makeup and hair before they come to the studio. It's part of our, like we send out a, a, a thing to our clients before they come in, and in that, if they didn't sign up for that session, we tell them to have their nails done, their, go to a professional, have their hair and makeup done, because that will obviously help that person a ton. <laughs> really, it does, because that makeup artist will know, just like you know how to light and pose them properly, they will know how to sculpt the makeup to make that person um, accentuate the beauty in that person also. So that, and, and the other thing that I do is I do, um, is I, I, uh, I don't like do a hairstyle with them, but I also um, um, mess up their hair or just do, you know, have a clip and I pull their hair back or let their hair fall in front of their face or use a fan and kind of give a glamorous look like that. Throwing some little fun hair things in there like that too with the subject is going to also, you know, give it that kind of fun, flavorful, beautiful kind of a look to it. So don't be afraid to to get in there and and, and mess up that hair and, and let it blow and and um, pull it back off their face and and do some things like that that are going to um, kind of give it that fun, glamorous look too. All right, and. Now I am going to go in and uh, just try and grab the last few questions in here. So, um, Amanda, I just see your question here, and I don't know if you were in here for the whole um, the whole entire seminar. If you have a specific question, just send it to me directly, and I'll be more than glad to ask Rod. And and I'll yeah. you know that's not a problem at all. She had a slightly different question, so no problem. Um, let me see here. Hang on just a second. A bunch of questions came through just now. All right, here. Hang on just a second. And I think I, Amanda, I may have skipped one of your earlier – one of her earlier questions came through. And it, it moves all the questions from top to bottom very quickly. Sorry, everybody. She said, can we achieve these looks by using the same techniques with different modifiers such as soft boxes or umbrellas? Okay. So the question was, can you do this with, with a soft box or an umbrella? And I'm going to say um, definitely not an umbrella because you can't get the umbrella close enough to the subject without poking out their eyeball um, to achieve the same look. It, part of it is the proximity of the light to the subject and the size of the light to the subject um, that's giving it that look. Um, so, but possibly a softbox could do this. In this, like this lighting scenario I'm showing right now on the screen, if you replace the beauty dish with a smaller softbox um, or even a possibly a strip light, but more like a small square softbox, um, 18 to 24 inch small softbox, you could get a look that could be similar to this um, look that you're seeing um, with the beauty dish and the strip light. Same thing, you'd have to tip it at a 45 degree angle. If at all possible, you're going to want to mount that light a little bit off to the side. Or my lights are all on the ceiling um, so that you're shooting between the, so the two softboxes. What you're doing, you don't have a pole in the way. So, yep, you might be able to do it with a softbox. All right. And looks like we've just about run out of time here, guys. What I'm going to do now is just see – I'm just going to try and give a once-over. And if I didn't answer any – if I didn't ask your question, please just type it in again now. That way it's uh, the, the latest question on here while I sift through some of these old ones that have come in here. Okay. Um, this is from – we have a question here. Is there a compact light you would recommend for going on location, and do you only bring one light on location with you? Okay, great question. <laughs> so, so ask yourself this question. I, this is, I'm sorry, I'm going to answer your question with a question. 
But when you go out to shoot on location, what are you trying to achieve? The same thing when I'm creating, I have so many different lighting scenarios. Like what we've been talking about today is all about beauty lighting, basically, and how to make something more beautiful. But what are you trying to achieve when you're going on location and lighting? So if all I'm trying to do is make the light a little bit better or um, accentuate a little bit, um, then I will use, this is so cool. So on location on a shady day, I need some punch in my images, right? There's just no, you know, punch in the images at all. Everything's so flat on a shady day. So I actually use um, LED lights on shady days. They're compact, they're small, they're inexpensive. Um, but, uh, the website is ledlighting.com, and um, they have inexpensive, small, compact. They use the same batteries as your Canon 5D uses. Um, and they come, you know, that you can, so they're rechargeable and whatever, it comes with a charger and all that stuff for it, and, um, and a case and whatever. But on a, on a flat day, that's the compact lighting that I bring, or in a dark, shady alley, or um, something like that, just to give my images a little more punch, works fantastic. The, the light is maybe, uh, you know, four inches by eight inches or something. It's that tiny, and then three inches deep. So those LED lights are just great, really, really great for a scenario like that. But like the last scenario I was talking about, if I want to go with something a little more dramatic, I take, I use a beauty dish, and then I use a light stand called a turf stand, um, because they, uh, they, they, they're not, it's not, it goes right into the dirt. It doesn't work on concrete, obviously, <laughs> but great in a scenario, like in a field, it just, it's like a pitchfork in the ground on a light stand, and then my beauty dish, with a power light and a battery pack on location is what I'll use for more of a dramatic kind of a look. So it really depends on what I want to do. But I don't bring, because it's so, like, like look at this image, it's so windy where I live um, that I want a smaller light source like that. So I usually use a beauty dish when I'm on location, because if I use a softbox um, or an umbrella, it just blows all over the place. So, so yeah, I need to answer your question or the question. It really depends on where I'm going. So. All right, hopefully that, that hangs out uh, with that question for you, Vela. Yeah, and Rod, um, I, uh, absolutely. You know, that question, absolutely, you can. So the question is, can you use like a bed sheet or just, you know, anything you have around the house with that ring light? The answer is, you know what, definitely let, yes. You know why? Because um, just make sure your subject is like two or three feet away from your background. Because you're shooting at 2.8 and a longer lens, it's going to go out of focus. I use all kinds of crazy stuff in the background when I'm shooting with that ring light because um, the depth of field is so shallow and the, it has great fall off, so the background goes out of focus and it also goes, it's not lit very much. So um, I've used rugs <laughs> as background, uh, shower curtains, uh, um, uh, all kinds of crazy stuff, you know what I mean? Like a chunk of wood, or I even used to be some plywood one time, it looked killer by the way. Plywood makes it an awesome background. Um, and um, because of the fall off, it becomes unrecognizable. It's just an element. It's just a texture. It's just a color in the background. So um, definitely, you can you can. That's the beauty of the beauty light is that it has such a shallow depth of field. Whatever's in the background is just a big blurry mess. So it's kind of fun to play around with different little elements back there. Awesome. And um, this is a good question here from Susan. Uh, how can you minimize pores on the skin without a ring light? Um, well, I think that first lighting scenario would probably do that also. Um, mm -hmm. I use, actually, the, if you're not going to use a ring light and you want that, I, I would just, I, for photo, in Photoshop, we use a plugin called Portraiture. It's a plugin for Photoshop and it's a retouching tool. And it's basically click and the image is retouched to the level, you can dial in the level of softness and sharpness of the image. And basically, for something like that, where you're just trying to soften it up real quick and make it beautiful, I would use that plugin called Portraiture for it. And then if there are still some areas that need some retouching, like a larger blemish or an eye bag could be softened a little bit more, yeah, then you can go and use your patch tool. But just to go in there and quickly knock that down, make it beautiful, we use Portraiture on, yeah, 99 five percent of our images I would guess um, mm -hmm. just to knock that skin down so it's not as uh, porous 
All right, and um, since there's so many, uh, you know, just random questions, people want to know links for certain items like the beauty dish, the LED light. Um, if you have those off the top of your head or where you got them from, Rod, that would be great. And if not, I was going to say if anybody has any additional questions and they still want to get a hold of you, is there, a, um, you know, if you want to take us on oh, the web, absolutely. we can we can check absolutely. that out. Absolutely. Just go to my website. Again, it's PhotoViz website that I love because I customized it. And I just um, just redid my PhotoViz website about a week ago. And that's what the beauty of it is. Like, I just changed my branding, uh, you know, like our look and our colors this year. Um, and guess what? Um, I went to my PhotoViz website and branded it with like the rest of my business and it's all part of my plan. I can brand and change and I just love it. That's just one of the features obviously that I love, but, but, um, and it's so simple. Yeah, I mean, in, in a matter of an hour I was completely rebranded and my website looked like it was brand new and matched all of the rest of our business. So, yeah, whatever. You know I love PhotoViz, but <laughs> that's just one of the amazing features you guys have. Thank you. Yeah, we we love watching you uh, here at the office. We see you always change your website up so much, which is great. It's <laughs> awesome. Well, um, Rod, if you had any more slides, just let me know. I think that we are going to wrap things up, guys. So I think you've covered everything today as much as you could in our in our hour span we had. And thank you again for coming in, you know, the middle of the day as well as everybody else. We know the 2 p.m. time can be a little awkward, but we really appreciate everybody for taking the time to join us today. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. All right, everybody. Well, again, you guys, if you have questions, you can send them over either to myself here at PhotoBiz. You can write on our Facebook wall. You know, if you have feedback for us, awesome. We'd love to hear it. Go right on, um, go right on our Facebook wall at facebook.com slash PhotoBiz. Or if you loved today's session with Rod, you know, give him some shout-out on our wall and go right on his, uh, on his fan page wall. Give him some shout-out. So we always love seeing feedback and We'd love to see you in our next webinar next week on Tuesday. So, Rod, thank you again so much for the great presentation. It's always a pleasure to have you on our program with us. And we definitely would love to do another one in the future, so we will we'll be in contact. And I know everyone here uh, is leaving a lot of great comments that they appreciated all the information today. <laughs> and, and a very convenient time to lose audio again. Sorry about that, everybody. I'm, I'm sure it will pop back in here in just a moment here on Rod's end. And let me just make sure he can get in here so we can give you guys one last goodbye. <laughs> I said, sorry, the random you know, best time. Goodbye, you guys. <laughs> I know. I said, let me make sure that he can get in here and say goodbye. Well, everybody is uh, giving out shout-outs here, thanking you for the great <laughs> webinar, you, and they you. learned a lot. So, guys, um, again, if you have the opportunity to ever hear Rod speak in the future or, you know, if you're hanging out at PPA Imaging or WPPI or at Sync and you're there, um, I met, that's where I met Rod in person. Rod, you're a super awesome guy, very approachable, and it's great that you're always, you know, so willing to share all this information with everybody in the in industry. Oh, well, thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Well, guys, we're going to wrap things up. It was a pleasure again, and we're going to work on that video recording, and if you have any other questions, again, like I said, just shoot them over to me here at PhotoBiz, or Rod's email is evans at evansimages.com. Perfect. So that'll do it for today. All right, everybody. We hope you have a great afternoon. All right, Rod. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, sir. All right. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.